back to week number seven of our series, His Story. I want to welcome our Sepulpa campus, our Coeta campus, our online viewers. I'm glad you've been along with us on this journey. We're almost halfway through it now as we have walked through the entire life of Jesus. We've been walking through this story after story after story. You know lots of stories about Jesus, but sometimes how they fit together and how his life unfolded uh, maybe is a mystery. And even beyond that, our true goal has been not just to know about Jesus, but to know Jesus. And not just to believe in Jesus, but to truly trust Jesus in what, what he says. And so I hope that you're reading along with your copy of of his story. I, I hope you got a copy of this, or at the least that you're uh, reading through the references, reading from your own Bible. Maybe you've got an online uh, edition of this, and, and uh, I, I, I just trust that you are taking the time and reading along, not just hearing this, not just catching the highlights. That, that's all I'm doing on Sunday uh, morning is, is catching those highlights. I hope that you're reading along where you can get the full story. Now, I know because I'm like this too, some of you have gotten behind. Some of you are stuck. Maybe you're stuck in chapter 3 or stuck in chapter 4. You left the book at work or you left it at home or left it in the car and now, now you're just, you, you need to get caught up and you keep thinking, I'm going to get caught up and I'm going to read and get everything caught up to this point. And, 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 and here, we're going to absolve you from all of that. Do not catch up at this point in time. All I want you to do is read chapter 7. Just, just get to chapter 7. Skip ahead. There is not a test on this. For those of you that you know, have some uh, OCD or something, just, just get over it and, and we're going to move on. And you can skip all of that chapter. You can come back to it later if that makes you feel better. Mark it, highlight it, dog ear it. i got to come back and do this. But for right now, just jump ahead and let's go to chapter 7 and, and read along as we're walking through this. What you're going to see in chapter 7 is we move into the third year of Jesus' ministry. And, and, and what you're going to see is an intentional shift in the way that Jesus does things. One of those shifts is that you are going to see Jesus move from working just with, with people of the, the Jewish heritage and faith to beginning to spend more time with, with the Gentiles. Uh, uh, in fact, part of what is happening here is that the, the, the Jewish leaders and teachers are fed up with Jesus. They, they keep having this, these confrontations and it just seems like a conflict every time. But it's not just the, the Pharisees and, and the teachers and leaders. At this point, even some of the, just the Jewish crowds are fed up with Jesus because remember after Jesus fed the 5,000, uh, he started talking to them in terms that just kind of set them off. Like, I'm, I want you to, to eat my flesh and I want you to drink my blood. In fact, the next time he says that, I want you to gnaw on my flesh. And it just kind of freaks the people out and the crowds begin to dissipate. Followers begin to leave Jesus. And so the result is Jesus in this chapter we see is going to spend probably more time than any other time with a Gentile audience. The second shift that takes place is because some of those crowds have left, because he's offended some of the people, Jesus now is going to spend more of his time talking with just his disciples. It's going to be a smaller group of people. Jesus is going to concentrate most of his time at dealing with his, his disciples and, and preparing them because they, they are about to enter into a time where they're going to have to step up and they're going to become the leaders of his church. And, and, and part of why we do some of the things that we do relate to this very thing right here. Because Jesus understood this, and I believe this, that disciples are created in a smaller group setting. Disciples are created when, when there is a small enough group of people that you can speak into their lives. That's exactly what Jesus is going to do. He's had the crowds following him, and now in, in, in this last year of ministry, he's going to dedicate the majority of his time into the, this handful of disciples trying to prepare them for what lies ahead with them. Now, that's sometimes where we get stuck when we talk about models of churches because there's lots of churches that are all about getting a crowd of people together. That's an 
important thing. You are probably watching this with a crowd of people right now. And I am so glad that you are doing that at one of our campuses, and, 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 and that's a good thing. But I also believe that at some point, you have to get into a smaller group setting where true discipleship takes place. And I hope that you'll get to the point at, at some point where you're, uh, where you've, uh, even if you're not comfortable, will take that step and move out of what is comfortable for you because I, I believe that it's truly in that discipleship setting, that smaller group setting, that we begin to grow like Jesus wants us to grow. And this is a great time to do it. If you've never been in a group, it's a good time for you to do it as we're walking through his story. Group leaders, I want to remind you just how important Important. If you're one of our Ridge Group leaders, how important your job is in helping move people along, helping disciple people. It's such an important job, and I, I hope everyone will, will spend some time and, and make that a priority uh, as Jesus and his disciples did. Now, let's get right into the story. Uh, there is going to be this crazy thing that happens. I'm calling it the hand-washing incident. What's going to happen is some Pharisees are going to come up to Jesus and go, Hey, Jesus! Why aren't your disciples washing their hands before they eat? That seems like a pretty good question to us. I mean, that may be a question that you would ask your young child, or maybe your old child, or maybe your husband. Hey, wash your hands before you eat. The problem was that that's not what they were asking like we would ask it. It had nothing to do with cleanliness. What this had to do with was for religious purposes. The, the, the Pharisees weren't asking why, why uh, Jesus' disciples, why they weren't washing their hands to clean off the germs so they would eat. In fact, germs weren't even invented at this point in time, or at least nobody knew they were uh, around at this point in time. This was a tradition that was taking place, an oral tradition that had been passed on through the rabbinic laws. We know it as the Talmud now. And there were specific methods by which they washed their hands. And you can go back and read all about them. They were to hold their fingers up, they let the water drip down their elbows, very specific cleansing instructions, not to save you from germs, but to save you from uncleanness. It's kind of like when you were in grade school and there, was, uh, there were those girls, or if you were a girl, it was those boys, it was the people of the opposite sex that had cooties. And so that's a little bit of what they were dealing with. They were concerned that if a good Jew went out into the market that he might touch some produce or something that a Gentile had touched and the cooties would jump onto him. And so they were constantly practicing this hand washing and it was all about religious ritual for them. The problem Jesus is going to bring before them is that it is just a tradition. It is not scripture. It is not something that's called for in the Old Testament. It is not something that God asked his people to do in this sense. This has just been something that they, they, they put together as an oral tradition. And Jesus is telling them, you're missing the point. In fact, look what he says to them in a harsh term. You hypocrites! He's calling the Pharisees hypocrites. Now, we've talked about that word a little bit before. It is a Greek term. And so to call somebody a term that was outside of their ethnicity and heritage, for one thing, was offensive to the, to the Pharisees. They did not eat Greek food. They certainly did not go to the Greek theater, which this is a theatrical term. And so they're offended that, you would, that, that, that Jesus would even use a term like that. But then the term actually comes from a theater when you put on a mask and it means to pretend to be something that you really are not. That's the most offensive thing for them is Jesus is saying, you're pretending to be something that you're not by doing the things that you do. You hypocrites. Isaiah the prophet was right when he prophesied about you. Now he's going to use some of their own prophets to tell them and to, and to kind of rebuke them. These people honor me with their lips, but listen to this. But their hearts are far from me. They're saying the right things. They're doing the right things. They've got the right actions. They've got the right behavior. They're, they're using all the right words, but they're not honoring me. Their hearts don't honor me. How might you ask, is that taking place? 
In fact, Jesus is going to give an example of that. He says, you know the commands. Honor your father and mother. In fact, the punishment for someone that is not obedient, does not honor. He talks about that in the story. And what Jesus is referring to is a practice called korban. And what that meant is you could set aside a part of your money and you could give it to God in essence, while at the same time you could reap the benefits of it. So it would be kind of like estate planning. You could set aside part of your estate and say, when I die, I want this to go to the temple or to God or whatever. And in the meantime, you're taking the interest. In the meantime, you're receiving the benefits of that, which is a perfectly good thing to do, except what was happening is people then were using that as an excuse to not taking care of their parents. I would love to take care of my aging parents, but I have this korban. I have, I have dedicated this money to God, and I am not to use it to take care of the very things that God told us to do. And so they were getting out of a, a godly command through their own traditions. They were placing traditions, their, their oral traditions, over the commandments of God. And that's exactly what Jesus is trying to differentiate between. In fact, a couple of verses later, he talks to them about this hand-washing ceremony that they're doing. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out the body? But the things that come out of a person's mouth come, here we go, from the heart, and these defile them for out of the heart, Come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person, but eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. Jesus is saying it's not eating with unwashed hands that makes you evil or makes you dirty. That's not what defiles you. It's what comes out of you that defiles you. So here's what the Pharisees believed. They believed that it went from your hand to your mouth into your heart. And Jesus is saying, that's not the way it works. You have it exactly backwards. It starts in your, in your heart, it comes out of your mouth, and then your hands follow suit. Jesus is saying, you're getting this all wrong. It all starts in the heart. Now, before we're too hard on the Jews of that day, it's certainly simple for us to kind of adopt some of those same practices and put our traditions ahead of the things that, uh, that God tells us to do. Now, the Jews did it in this way. They did it with their diet, they did it with their days, and they also did it uh, with their dress. And we tend to do those things. They had certain things that they could not eat, certain things that were unclean, and those kind of get changed from Jesus' words. And as, we, as the Jews step into the book of Acts and, and the Christians begin to, uh, to evangelize people outside the Jewish faith, and, 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 and it, it, changes, it changes that completely. Uh, but we've done some of the same things about things that are unclean. It may not be pork for us, or it may not be lobster for us, but we in the church world, kind of declare our own dietary things. And if you don't keep these, then you're not a good Christian. It may be alcohol. It may be tobacco. And we may have really good reasons for saying these are not a part of our diet. But we tend to put things and create traditions that, that are not commandments from God. We do it with our dress. They had certain things that they had to wear, the robes and the, the prayer tassels and, and, and things on their head. And, and uh, you know, while we don't have that and we would kind of maybe look down on that, uh, we still do that with the church. We expect people to dress modestly. And there are certain things that, that some Christians don't do. They would never have maybe a tattoo or they would never wear, a man would never wear an earring. And so some people have their own traditions there, and they have placed those traditions before commandments of God. I'm not saying that any of those things are bad or good. It's just we put those ahead of what God says are the important things. Or, or we might even do it with our days. They had certain feasts that they had to follow. They had certain uh, festivals that they had, to, they had, the Sabbath day, and while we maybe don't participate in the Jewish festivals and special days, um, we do have our day in the church world at Sunday. 
and people that go to church on Sunday. That's kind of our marker. That's kind of our tradition. And if you, if you come to a, a, a group meeting on Sunday night or come Wednesday night or come special, then, then, then we look at that person and what we've done is we put tradition ahead of God's commandments. We put things ahead of what God says are the important things. Now here's the deal. We can't evaluate a person's goodness on the rules of men. That, we can't do that. We can't put them above the law of God and say that our rules are more important, that we're going to judge people on our rules, not the laws of God. And, and often we do that. Our church has a history of doing that, of saying we've got these man-made laws. And the problem with that is it is wrong to, to use man-made rules to show someone or decide someone's value in the eyes of God. It's wrong to, to take man-made rules and decide someone's value. But even the worst thing, I think, is it is wrong to ascribe to a list of things that have to be, to be done to be a part of our church and then to at least come off with the expectation of people outside the church that if you don't look like this and if you don't do things, then you're not welcome in this church. And what happens is the very people that need to be a part of the church are kept away from the church because of traditions and because of external things that we keep. And what Jesus keeps coming back to us lesson after lesson after lesson is this is a heart thing. It is a heart matter. In fact, I want you to write it down this way. Start with your heart. It's all about the heart. It's all about starting from the inside out. And the thing that the Jews wanted to do is they wanted to start from the outside in. They always wanted to talk about behavior. They always wanted to talk about action. They always wanted to talk about traditions. But it's not about the doing that is so important to Jesus. It's more about what we're becoming. Doing is important. Don't get me wrong. The actions, the behavior, those are all important to God. Jesus wants us holy. But he says it starts from the heart and works its way out, not the other way around. An authentic walk with Jesus begins from the inside out. When we get it right on the inside, then we don't have to work so hard to get the behavior to, to, to cooperate. The behavior is going to do it. But if you're constantly trying to make your behavior function that way without changing your heart, it is going to be a frustrating thing. And I think that's why lots of Christians get fed up and get worn out and get burned out is they, they're trying to, to put on the right actions and they're shortcutting it by not starting with the heart. It's re reiterating what Jesus has been saying all along when he said on the Sermon on the Mount, it's all about your motivation. It starts with the heart. It's not just about murder. It's about the anger in your heart. It's not just the outward action of killing someone, it's the anger first that you harbor in your heart. It's not just about committing adultery. That's wrong, but it's wrong to have the lust in your heart. And Jesus reminds us that those things uh, come from the heart. Those things uh, are, are, are where they start. It happens in the heart. Now, what's interesting is that Jesus is going to go have a conversation now with a Canaanite woman. He's going to go to the area of Phoenicia, which is on towards the Mediterranean Sea, it is north and it is west of the Sea of Galilee. In fact, he is going to actually leave the region of Galilee where, where the Jewish people live, and he is going to go to the edge of that, maybe even outside the boundaries of that, and he is going to be in an area where he runs into a woman, and this person is another outsider. This is another person that is desperate. This is a woman who has a daughter who is demon-possessed. And this particular woman says, son of David, have mercy on me. One of the few times where that term is used towards Jesus. And it expresses at least her connection with his identity and, and who he is. And Jesus, Jesus ignores her. Jesus doesn't even respond to her. In fact, the disciples, after she asks again, say, Jesus, send her away. We're not even, even going to bother with her. But she persists and she says, please, please help me. And Jesus, again, now strikes up the conversation, and he says, I've come to save the lost sheep of Israel. He even uses the term dog with her. 
I mean, for Jesus, that term dog, and for a Jew, that was an unclean animal. It was someone that was out at the dump and, 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 and you know, savaging things there. And yet for this woman, she says, well, even a dog needs, uh, needs the, uh, the scraps off the table. And so for her, she's saying, well, Jesus, I, 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 know, I know what you came for, but, but even a dog expects to get some scraps. And Jesus said to her, good answer. He says, you have, you have great faith. And we're told that he healed this woman's daughter. He cast that demon out of her at that very hour. What I find interesting about this story, again, is this woman is an outsider. It shows Jesus now moving outside the realm of the people of, of Jewish background, and he is connecting with people that are Gentiles. But I also have to notice that her faith was rewarded after she clarified who Jesus was. Multiple times she says, Lord, Lord, have mercy on me. She was able to identify who Jesus was when even some of the people on the inside were unable to. Now, we're told that Jesus is going to travel all the way to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and he's going to be in the area known as the Decapolis. We talked about this just last week, the region of ten cities. And Jesus is going to perform a miracle there. Now, remember, we talked about how he had cast the multiple demons out of the man into the pigs, and he told that man to go tell people what he had done. The townspeople said, Jesus, get out of here. Jesus, we want you to leave. But Jesus now is back for the first time, and crowds are flocking around him. We believe it had something to do with that man who had previously been possessed with demons telling people who Jesus was and what he had done in his life. And people are bringing the sick and the, the, the lame, and Jesus is healing them, and Jesus is teaching them. And after about three days of this, Jesus says, hey, these people, they haven't eaten. Maybe they had food for a day. Maybe they even had a little bit of a snack left over for the second day. But it's the third day, and nobody has anything to eat. We've got to find something. And the disciples are looking around going, hey, don't look at us. We don't have any bread. He says, how much bread do we have? They said, seven loaves. And they collected the bread and it, we're told that Jesus performs a miracle and feeds these 4,000 people. Sounds an awful lot like that previous miracle of Jesus feeding 5,000. In fact, there are some scholars that believe that is the same miracle. I think that's a little silly because this talks about it being in a completely different area. It describes a, a, a different number of people. In fact, Jesus, after the fact, is going to talk about both cases in which he did that. Again, a completely separate group of people. For 5,000, it was Jewish people. These are Gentiles that Jesus is performing the second miracle, feeding 4,000. But it's still significant. In fact, we're told that, that after everybody had been fed, once again, baskets were filled up, started with seven loaves. Everybody fed uh, till they could eat no more. In fact, literally, they were stuffed Full. That's what it says. They ate so much that they were full. They were, after Thanksgiving with the elastic pants, full. That's how full they were. And they bring back seven baskets full. Uh, I think that's significant uh, to remember that. Started with seven loaves, ended with seven baskets. You might wonder, as I did, as you're reading through there, it seems like the disciples were clueless. I mean, they, they had seen Jesus do this before. What was so difficult? I don't know what the answer to that is, except they're still struggling in this area of believing, that, of believing what Jesus can do, of having complete confidence in God. And even though they'd seen this happen before, they seemed to still struggle with how could Jesus provide in this circumstance. They are growing in that area as all of us are. Well, one of the next stories that we see is Jesus and his disciples arriving in an area that's called Caesarea Philippi. It's a town that's about 25 miles north of the Sea of Galilee, and it's a special area. In fact, it is somewhat of an oasis. This is an area where there's a picturesque mountain behind it, and there are springs flowing, and it feeds this desert area, and it becomes a lush, almost park-like area. In fact, uh, it was believed to be kind of like that, kind of like a national park where people in that day could go and rest and relax and camp. 
And the people that came there, they brought their pagan beliefs there. In fact, along this wall, uh, uh, the, the wall of this mountain, people had actually, actually chiseled out little niches and there were places where they placed pagan gods all along this area. And so you've got this beautiful park-like setting, but a tremendous pagan deity presence that's there. And you've got all this beautiful stuff and all these godly pagan idols there. And it's in that setting that Jesus with just his disciples say, hey, who, who, do, you, who do people say that I am? Now, it might be easy to think that Jesus was trying to figure out, you know, what are, what's, what's the word on the street? But Jesus is heading somewhere with this, and some of the disciples say, well, you're John the Baptist. You, you're you're kind of like the guy who calls out the, 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 the public figures and confronts them, and that would certainly be accurate of Jesus. Well, some people say that you're Elijah. You know, Elijah uh, was a miracle worker, and you're doing all kinds of miracles, and so you're like a new Elijah. Some say you're Jeremiah. You're the weeping prophet, and Jesus certainly does some of that, especially for, for Jerusalem. But he was, uh, 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 again, people thought that. Some say you're a prophet. Some, some say that you're, you're a person uh, that just the God sent. And that probably sums up what people think of Jesus today, that he was a good guy, that he was a miracle worker, that, that he was somebody that was, was a good teacher, maybe even a prophet. Uh, most people, in fact, would not disagree with any of those good statements made about Jesus. But Jesus is going to ask another question. Question number two is going to be more direct. And he's going to say, okay, but who do you say that I am? Emphasis on you. Who do you say that I am? And that really is the important question for us, isn't it? It's who do we say that Jesus is? That's the question that's going to matter for all of us in eternity is who do we say that Jesus is? Not just who do you think Jesus is, not who do you believe Jesus to be, but Jesus specifically says, who do you say? Jesus wanted to know that they were willing to confess, confess freely who he was. And you know the story. It's Peter that answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Maybe your version says you are the Christ. It's the same word. Christ is, it, Christos is the Greek word there, and it's the transliteration of, of the Hebrew term here. It just simply means the anointed one. You are the one set apart by God. They used to anoint people to set them apart as a king or, or as a prophet. And, and they were saying you are the anointed one that, that God has set apart. You are the son of God. Now, while we certainly understand that to be a, a biological relationship, uh, your son, uh, a, a father, they're, they're biologically related. While that was certainly true, it goes beyond that. Uh, because uh, they talked about son of as being like having the character of. We, we even do that a little bit today. We call somebody a, a son of a gun, and we're talking about a specific character trait not a biological relationship there. And so you have the character of God. And not just, not just one of the lifeless gods, not just one of these, these, these pagan idols that are all around this mountainside, but the one true and living God. You are the son of the living God, is what Peter says. You, you are the son, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And what we're reminded about this is that we need to confess from the heart. That you confess from your heart. That's what Peter is doing here. He's expressing who Jesus is to himself. He is believing that Jesus is God in the flesh. And it's something that comes out of the depths of his heart. You know, you have probably done that at some point if you're married. Uh, if you're a guy, there was some point where you expressed your love and your devotion to someone and said, I want you to marry me. I would like for you to marry me. Will you marry me? And from that point on, life changed for you. There was an expression, a confession from your heart of your love and your devotion, and things changed for you. And from that point on, you devoted, you, 
you, you, your, your life was, was, was kind of single-minded. You didn't Facebook old girlfriends. You didn't write them notes. For those of you, some of you, that Facebook wasn't even invented at that point in time. Uh, but you changed things. You became single-minded in your relationship, in that devotion. And that's exactly what happens to Peter. He is expressing that confession from his, from, from, from his heart. And Jesus says, that didn't come just from you, Peter. That came from God himself. And upon that rock, he says, I will build my church. Upon that rock, that statement that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, I will build my church. And here we are 2,000 years later. We are still united by that confession of faith that Jesus is not just a good man, a good teacher, a miracle worker, that Jesus is, in, in fact, God in the flesh. He is the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one of the very one and true and living God. And he came to this earth, and he is the one that established his church, and we still celebrate that. And when people join our church, they make this confession, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And when people get baptized into that baptistry before, before they're, they're immersed in that water, they say, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. It's what brings us together. It starts from your heart. And it becomes a confession from the heart. Well, we need to go on. Matthew 6.21 says, from that time on, right at the end of the Peter's confession there, from that time on... we probably ought to stop with that because that's a significant phrase in the Gospel of Matthew. In fact, it's only used two times and it's a marker for things are going to change. In fact, in Matthew chapter 4, after Jesus' birth, after his baptism, after his temptation, we're told from that time on, Jesus began to preach, the king, repent, the kingdom of heaven is near. And so we went from the beginning parts of Jesus into his ministry. It marked the beginning of his ministry. In fact, we go all the way to Matthew chapter 26. We see the third time that Matthew uses it. It's right after Judas agrees to betray Jesus. And it marks the end of Jesus' ministry and the beginning of the passion events at the very end of Jesus' life. The only other time we have it is recorded right here in Matthew 6, 21. And again, it is about to set apart something else, something different is going to take place where it is marking for us what's going to take place. Mark 16, 20, or Matthew 16, 21, from that time on. In other words, now that the disciples begin to understand who Jesus is, now that they have clarification, and now that they have confessed through Peter's verbal testimony of who Jesus is, now that they understand that the, he is the Messiah, Jesus is about to explain to them what that means. In fact, as you were reading through chapter 7, or if you haven't done already, you will notice that there are multiple times where Jesus is going to prepare his disciples by talking about his death and his resurrection. And what Mark's here in Matthew 16, 21 is that we will see that, that Jesus is going to begin to talk openly about who he is and what that will mean for him. He's alluded to it already that he is going to die, that he is going to be, but it's been pretty vague and it just went over the disciples' head. But from this time on, Jesus is going to be, begin to be very open. He'll explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. And we will hear from now on that continual refrain telling his disciples, this is about to happen. I am the Messiah. I am the Son of the living God. And this is what it means for me. And this is what it will mean for you my followers. In fact, it's in that same conversation that he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple just means my follower. Whoever wants to follow me must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. You want to be my follower? Jesus says you've got to take up your cross. You know, for our culture, that doesn't seem like a big deal. I've got a cross got one hanging off my rearview mirror. I wear a cross around my neck. I've got my cross. We have turned the cross into an ornament. That was not the case in Jesus' day. You would not think of ever wearing a cross because it was a means 
of execution. We've turned it into something good. We've, 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 we've changed it from what it used to be. It was a means of death. It was a, a, a means of, of execution. And, and, and throughout centuries, we've changed it into something else. During the Middle Ages, uh, people put it on shields, the cross on shields. It was a sign of victory. We put it on steeples and on sides of churches as a declaration of our identity, of who we are. That wasn't the case in Jesus' day. Cross meant big loser. You are going to die. You have touched a cross. You are going to die in the most excruciating, shameful way known to man. And Jesus says, if you want to be my follower, you will take up your cross daily. You will give up your life and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. And again, all we're understanding from that is you surrender all your heart. Jesus is saying, I, I, I want all of you. I, I don't want just a piece of you. I don't want just a Sunday morning section of you. I want all of you. You must give up all your life to follow me. It requires your whole heart. It requires your whole life. You have to be fully surrendered to me. If you want to be a disciple of Jesus, you are not a true disciple if you have not turned over everything to him. Oh, we don't, we don't get that because it's so easy for us to be partially committed to things and partially uh, uh, committed to, to, to being a Christian. And, and Jesus says, there's no, there's no part way here. It's either you're all in or you're not in at all. Well, it's, part of this chapter ends with what's called the transfiguration. It's a few days later after this confession of faith that, that Jesus is going to take just Peter, James, and John on up the mountain. And something amazing is going to happen while we're there. We're told that instantly the disciples, they fall asleep. That's something that they tend to do on a regular basis. But after they fall asleep, Jesus' face starts shining. We're told that his clothes become as white as light, and two other figures appear with him, Moses and Elijah. It causes the disciples to wake up, and they're in awe. And here are two of their their biggest heroes, Moses and Elijah. We're not told how we know that, or how they knew that that was Moses and Elijah. But remember, Moses was like the national leader, the national hero. And Elijah was like the prophet, the supreme prophet. Everybody respected these two. If there were two Jews that you would hold up uh, in history... These were the two right here, and they both are instantly, they are all instantly amazed at this. In fact, it's Peter that says, all my heroes are here. Let me build a monument to all three of you. And Jesus has an interesting response to that because this is not the case of Moses, the greatest leader ever, and Elijah, another great leader, and Jesus, another great leader who I follow. Jesus is making sure that Peter understands it's all about Jesus. It's all about him. Jesus is not just one of a great leaders. He is is the only one. In fact, God's going to come and his voice, one of the rare times that we hear God's voice recorded in Scripture, when he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. Sounds a little familiar to what we heard at Jesus' baptism. Except this part. Listen to him. I'm not sure I know what all this particular event means. It certainly is pointing to a future resurrection. Certainly pointing to a time where Jesus is going to leave his disciples and ascend into heaven. But it certainly gives us a glimpse of who Jesus really is. And we have the Father who is giving his own testimony again pointing to Jesus, saying, this is my son. And we're reminded that it's all about Jesus. When you start with the heart, and you confess from your heart that Jesus is Lord, the Son of God, and when you allow him to take all of you, he will take your heart and your life And he will transform you, 
and he will change your actions and he will change your behavior and he will turn you and conform you into the person that he wants you to be. And you will be a better you, but it doesn't come from you doing it. It comes from you first giving all of your heart to Jesus. Have you let him do that? Father, we thank you for your son Jesus and what he means to us and what he offers us. And Father God, would you forgive us when we have been people of a casual faith, where we have been part-time followers, where we've refused to be fully devoted. God, forgive us for allowing that to happen. Forgive us for not pushing and encouraging one another to live fully for you. I'm praying, God, that there are people listening that will commit fully to you, that they will choose to pick up their cross daily and to follow you. God, help us to confess you with our mouth wherever we go to express our devotion to you. And God, would you change us from the inside out? We pray it in Jesus' name.